Hello and welcome to another episode of History Stuff. So in the past few videos I've done a few uh, mini biographies of figures from the Scottish Wars of Independence in the late 13th and early 14th century. And in this one I want to switch to Wales and look at Llewellyn ap Griffith. So who was he? Who was this man? Well, Llewellyn is remembered in Wales as Ein Shu Olaf, or Our Last Prince, uh, meaning the last Welsh Prince of Wales which is not uh, a strictly accurate nickname because he wasn't the last prince. He was followed immediately afterwards by his brother David and then his cousin Madog a few years later. Uh, and even after that, you had claimants such as Owen Laugoch uh, or more famously Owen Glendur. So Llewellyn was not the last prince in any real sense. Uh, what can be said is that he was the only Welsh prince of Wales to be acknowledged as such by a king of England. Uh, and in that respect, he was both the first and the last. Uh, but who was he exactly? Well, he was one of the four sons of Griffith ap Llewellyn, who himself was the eldest son of Llewellyn Vaur, or Llewellyn the Great, uh, a ruler of North Wales in the early to mid-13th century, who succeeded in imposing his power on much of Wales. Um, but Llewellyn Vaur was followed by his second son, David. Uh, the rules of succession are quite complicated in Wales, and there's a lot of internal conflict. Um, who was Llewellyn ap Griffith's uncle. And um, David only lasts a few years, um, but when he dies in 1246, uh, Llewellyn and his eldest brother, Owen Goch, Owen the Red, they step forward and they manage to seize power inside Gwynedd, inside the, the territory of North Wales. Uh, initially, at least, however, they are then forced to submit to the King of England, Henry III, who was very keen to impose his supremacy, his overlordship on North Wales and, and to control it. Um, but this is a very fragile settlement. It only lasts about uh, 10 years. And in the meantime, Llewellyn manages to establish himself as the, uh, the supreme power within Gwynedd. Um, he fights a war against two of his brothers, uh, Owain, who turns against him, and uh, a younger brother, David, who's a very controversial figure in Welsh history. Uh, Llewellyn meets them in battle at a place called Bryn Delwyn inside Gwynedd, uh, defeats them, uh, takes them prisoner. Uh, he doesn't kill them. Uh, one of the uh, interesting features of Llewellyn's career is that he was never bloodthirsty. Uh, he didn't execute any of his political enemies. Um, but that's not to say he couldn't be ruthless. Um, he imprisoned Owen Goch inside Dolbadan Castle for 22 years and then held him in tight custody, even though that made Llewellyn unpopular. Uh, lots of people inside North Wales called for Owen to be released, but he refused. He said, no, he's, he's staying there. Um, but he gave David a chance to redeem himself, which didn't turn out so well in the long run because David kept betraying him. Um, but for the time being, Llewellyn had uh, established his authority within Wales, and then in 1257 he takes the next step, which is to turn against the King of England, Henry III, and try to exploit Henry's vulnerability, because England is sliding into civil war, to uh, do basically what his grandfather had tried to do, and uh, impose the power of Gwynedd and the rest of Wales, and uh, essentially unite the country under a single ruler. And to begin with, uh, for the first uh, eight or nine years, Llewellyn is very successful. Uh, he's a very competent uh, military leader. Um, he's obviously very charismatic, very energetic. Um, he conducts a series of very successful campaigns against uh, both his enemies in Wales, uh, the Marcher lords, the, the English lords of the, the borderlands, or the March in Wales, and the armies of the King of England. And he, he inflicts one defeat after another upon all of these enemies until we get to the year 1267, uh, when Llewellyn finally comes to a negotiated settlement with Henry III, who's getting quite old at this point. Um, and they meet at the ford of Montgomery, uh, near Chester, where the kings of England and the Prince of Wales had traditionally met to settle their differences. And Henry takes the extraordinary step of acknowledging Llewellyn as Prince of Wales which no king of England had agreed to do before, and it's really a sign of, of Henry's uh, political weakness at this time, um, because England has been ravaged by years of civil war, um, the royal uh, control and domination of Wales has, has fallen away, 
basically, so he doesn't really have a great deal of choice um, except to um, agree to Llewellyn's, uh, uh, Llewellyn's demands. Um, the snag is that Llewellyn, in exchange for his title and for this formal acknowledgement, he has to swear homage and fealty to the king, uh, which is a typical medieval arrangement, and it basically means that the king is his overlord. Um, Llewellyn is literally his man, his vassal. Um, what this meant in practice was that you held your lands at the grace and favour of your overlord, who could take them away if he felt that you were being rebellious or disobedient. And you also owed him military service. You had to fight for him if he, if he asked for it. But even so, at the time, it was an extraordinary achievement because no other Prince of Wales had managed this. Um, and Llewellyn is basically left to rule the uh, more or less united Principality of Wales for another decade. So up until this point, Llewellyn is undeniably a very impressive, charismatic and successful figure. Uh, unfortunately, after 1267, it all starts to go wrong. Um, and there are all kinds of reasons for this. Um, Llewellyn, although he has won in the short term, he still has a lot of enemies uh, inside Wales um, and even within his own family. As I mentioned, he's got this very troublesome brother, David, who is never satisfied with anything, really, and he keeps rebelling and conspiring against Llewellyn. Um, and in 1274, uh, he actually conspires with the princes of Powys, uh, who are traditional enemies of the Lords of Gwynedd, to assassinate Llewellyn. Um, and it's a very, uh, very calculated plot. The idea was that they were going to creep into uh, Llewellyn's uh, sheath or his palace at night and actually murder him in his bedchamber. Uh, and it's only foiled because of bad weather, because of a snowstorm, uh, which prevents the killers from reaching the palace. Uh, this is followed by a brief civil war. Um, wh when Llewellyn finds out that what's, what was being planned, he goes after the assassins, um, including David, who all flee into England and take refuge at the court of the new King of England, Henry III's successor, and this is Edward I. Um, Edward I, a great bogeyman of Welsh and Scottish history. Um, but we should deal with these things in context rather than dealing in you know, the usual cliches. And it's, uh, it should be said that Edward was not set on warfare or the outright conquest of Wales from the start of his career. Uh, in his youth, he had actually um, said to his father that uh, they should leave Wales alone and, and give it back to the Welsh because it was not worth the effort. Um, the English and the Normans before them had been trying for centuries to conquer Wales and it's, um, it, it, it never really worked in the long term. It was basically this bottomless pit that the English kept throwing money and men into and not really getting very much in return. Uh, and as far as Edward is concerned, this is a complete waste of time and resources. But things change, um, and um, Llewellyn starts to make some fairly odd decisions. Um, I personally, I suspect that he suffered through a lack of good advice. Um, some of his best counsellors have died off by this point, and either Llewellyn is making decisions by himself, not really consulting anyone else, or he's listening to bad advice. But at any rate, um, from this point on, he can hardly do anything right, unfortunately. Um, he refuses to swear uh, the oath of homage to Edward repeatedly, even though um, he does actually owe this uh, via the, uh, the Treaty of Montgomery. And he also enters into um, a marriage treaty with the Montforts, who, um, the, the children of Simon de Montfort, who had been this famous rebel in England. Um, and while you can argue that Llewellyn was merely honouring an earlier agreement to marry Simon's daughter, Eleanor, um, so far as the King of England is concerned, this is um, simply provocative and um, not something he's prepared to tolerate because the Montforts are still regarded as very much a, a threat in England and a threat to England's security. Um, and all of these things combine with the fact that Llewellyn's government of Wales, his administration, was not particularly competent. Um, he strained every resource at his disposal to raise money. Though he wanted to do this to build castles and turn Wales into um, a proper unified functioning state like England. 
Uh, and you can see his motives, but his methods left a lot to be desired. Um, he dealt in some pretty heavy-handed strategies. Uh, he took a Welshman a prisoner, he took them hostage, um, he forced their relatives to pay up uh, money to have them released, um, and so on and so forth. He um, he loses the the allegiance of a great many uh, Welsh families um, who had earlier supported him. And when Edward I finally loses patience and he declares war in 1276, Llewellyn finds that he has grossly overestimated his, his position and his, his power in Wales. Um, and this um, very one-sided war uh, ensues in which uh, Llewellyn is uh, badly defeated. It's the first major defeat that he had suffered in his career and it was a combination of um, Edward I being um, perfectly willing to pump all of the resources of England against Llewellyn but also because Llewellyn's power base within Wales had just crumbled away um, most of the nobles of Wales they abandoned him and they they went and joined the king they joined his army and Llewellyn ends up in 1277 completely surrounded by land and sea and forced to surrender to a humiliating uh, treaty, the Treaty of Aberconwy, whereby he was left with his title, um, but basically stripped of all of the, um, the gains he'd made in the past 20 years. Uh, and uh, th this is a very uneasy situation because while Llewellyn has been um, weakened considerably, he's still there, he's not been killed, he's not been destroyed, and he's not going to just sit there and accept this this new arrangement. Um, uh, a very un uncertain and fragile peace reigns for about five years until finally the Welsh revolt again. And this is because uh, while they didn't like Llewellyn's administration, it turns out they don't like Edward's either because it's every bit as corrupt and oppressive as Llewellyn's government had been. And so you get this back to front situation whereas where all these Welsh nobles who, or many of them, who previously fought for the king, now go back to Llewellyn and Edward finds himself with a much tougher fight on his hands if he's going to um, keep control of Wales. Uh, and uh, the war that follows is much um, more bitter and um, bloodthirsty than the previous one. But uh, Edward is completely determined. Um, his armies suffer a couple of defeats, but that doesn't really dissuade him. He just calls up reinforcements, uh, raises more money, uh, and he's obviously completely determined to win uh, whatever it takes. Uh, Llewellyn is in a fairly desperate situation, uh, and what he does um, as a sort of last roll of the dice, he tries to break out into mid Wales, where he thinks he's spotted a weakness in the English defences. Uh, because he had been invited there by the local lords, who included his cousins, the Mortimers, the powerful family of the Middle March. Um, but when he gets there, it turns out that this invitation was a trap. They were simply trying to lure him out of the mountains of, of North Wales, where it's difficult to get at him, draw him into mid-Wales, uh, surround him and, uh, and kill him, which is what they do. It's a, it's a very uh, lethally executed ambush. Uh, the details are a bit murky of exactly what happened because there's so many conflicting accounts. Um, but essentially, uh, Llewellyn is captured by the Mortimers, and according to their own accounts, uh, he's allowed to see a priest and confess to a priest and hear mass before he's beheaded. So this suggests um, a, a sort of cold-blooded execution rather than a death in battle. Uh, Llewellyn's army is probably ambushed and scattered shortly afterwards. Uh, and Llewellyn is beheaded. Uh, his head is taken to the king, who then shows it to the troops. Uh, and then it's then paraded through London with a, a crown of uh, ivy on its head in mockery of an ancient prophecy, supposedly by Merlin, that uh, Llewellyn would one day be crowned in London. And so he was, but um, not in ideal circumstances. Um, and that's the end of him. Um, he, as I said, he was followed by his brother David, uh, who had a very short and tragic reign that lasted only a few months before he is captured, betrayed by fellow Welshmen, and uh, horribly executed at Shrewsbury, hung, drawn, and quartered like William Wallace was a few years later. Uh, and that leads to the um, permanent conquest of Wales, the Edwardian conquest of Wales. It's a very traumatic event in Welsh history. 
Uh, okay, so that was a very brief overview of Llewellyn um, within about 15 minutes, which is as short as I can make it, really. Uh, there's obviously a lot more to discuss because Llewellyn had such a, a packed career. Uh, one thing I would recommend to anyone who's really interested is Llewellyn's biography by uh, J. Beverly Smith. Very long book, excellent book, genius, really, um, packed full of detail and a must read for anyone who has a real interest in, in the career of this um, sort of enigmatic individual. Okay, thank you. I hope you enjoyed that and I'll see you again.